Hello everybody, I'm some loudmouth on the internet with an opinion. My first review on this channel was for a little movie called Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Needless to say, I fucking hated that movie, and I consider it to be by far the worst movie involving either of these monsters. If there was any justice in the world, everyone who responsible for this movie would be working at McDonald's for the rest of their lives due to their extreme lack of talent. But as most of us have long ago figured out, there is no justice in this world, and thus the directors of that pile of slime actually did manage to direct another movie. Yep, Greg and Colin Strauss made another movie. Hey, at least time they're only making up their own crap instead of uh, ruining a once awesome franchise like last time. It's worth noting that Greg and Colin Strauss have not made a single movie since the movie I'm about to review today. Gee, I can't imagine why anyone in Hollywood would not want to put these guys in charge of another movie after seeing Alien vs. Predator Requiem. Hmm. Oh yeah, that. So after they were finished with that quote-unquote piece of cinema, they moved on to making yet another alien invasion movie that has the honor of taking a genre that's known for being silly and improbable and making it far more silly and improbable. That movie is known as Skyline. So how does a movie with aliens invading the planet and the entire world in danger manage to be so incredibly dull? Well, the Strauss brothers find a way with this repulsive and stupid movie featuring nothing of value compared to so many better movies of the genre. So I'm going to take this nice sweet cup of coffee to prevent myself from falling asleep as I try to make it through Skyline. So we start the movie with a pretty couple in bed having blue light attack them from outside their window. Jerry. I'm under attack by aliens too right now. Don't you believe that's exactly what's happening to me? See the light beginning to change the man, and then we cut to a flashback to 15 hours earlier. So it's necessary to see how this couple got in bed that night, because no one could believe that someone would possibly sleep at night in a bed without some kind of backstory. J-Rock, T-Money. Oh no, we were, we were ahead of our time. So this couple, whose names are J-Rod and Elaine, and I'm not gonna say which is which name because patriarchy, are flying to Los Angeles to celebrate a birthday party of Terry, played by Donald Fieson, a successful show business guy after gaining mostly unexplained stardom. You really did it, man. Yeah. I mean, just like everybody knew you would, but... Couldn't have done it without you. Happy birthday, Terry. Yeah. Happy birthday to me. A totally relatable bunch for the general audience. We then proceed to spend the next several minutes of this movie with the characters partying by the pool, having a good time, basically hanging out with Hollywood big shots. Hell, we even get a shot at the Transformers movies. Thank you. How's the robot fight coming along? Oh, dude, it sucks. But the director loves it, so, you know. <laughs> You know, normally I'm all for sticking it to Michael Bay's god-awful Transformers movies, but in the case of this movie, Strauss Brothers, those who live in glass houses. So Terry offers J-Rod a job in effects in Los Angeles. I don't know anything about effects, man. That's bullshit, come on. Which doesn't sit well with Elaine, who delivers Jared some very special news. You sprung this whole California thing on me today, all right? I had no idea. I didn't come I'm out. late. Since when? I don't know. I've been feeling sick all week, so I took a test and... Why didn't you tell me? I wanted to. Believe me, I just... I didn't want to ruin your trip. You didn't want... Shit. Is that all you have to say? What do you want me to say? I don't think I'm ready for this. You're not... Our first bit of character development from our main character. And it's that he's a bit of a douchebag. In order to show just the maturity level of the average guests of this party of Hollywood Big Shots, the next scene shows them filming other people in other rooms having sex and broadcasting it on their televisions to laugh at them. Oh, yeah. Just what every bad movie needs, a little bit of homophobia to start your workday. 
We then proceed to restart the movie exactly at the same place we were before the movie flashbacked. And if you see a long tunnel, stay away from the light! Making the last 15 minutes mostly pretty pointless, as we don't really learn anything about these characters during that whole flashback sequence, except that Elaine is pregnant, and that information could have been delivered later on. And we learn absolutely nothing whatsoever about these aliens. You know, I said this last year in my review of Alien vs. Predator Requiem. This movie is like watching a bad teen drama on MTV that ends with a bunch of space monsters killing the cast. Now that I think about it, that would make a really good ending to those shows. Well, that applies to this movie even more. The last 15 minutes, I felt more like I was watching Clit It Up with the Kardashians or something. I certainly didn't feel like I was watching an entertaining science fiction movie. So Jared seems to be headed towards the light until Terry pulls him away from it. Jared! Jared! Wait, why'd the aliens just give up there? We see later in this movie that the aliens are trying to take everybody, so what point do they serve in flashing them with the light and then just leaving them there other than extending this movie. So yeah, they watch the aliens temporarily leave for some reason, and then they come to a brilliant deduction on what they should do. Jared, check this out. There are people on the roof. What are they doing? I don't know. We should check it out. You. Are. Retarded. So yeah, even though these aliens are attacking the planet from the sky, these two morons decide to grab a handgun and head to the roof. You know, aliens, we don't really need you because natural selection is doing your job for you. It's calm. Damn it, Jared! You didn't tell me to hold it open. Thought it was common sense! <sighs> Dude, if you had common sense, you wouldn't have gone on the roof in the first place! So from the rooftop, they witness the aliens causing all kinds of their destruction. And that is most of this movie, just watching these annoying characters look out their window over a rooftop at some bad CGI destruction. Admittingly, the effects work here is rather impressive, given the movie's budget was well under $20 million. But, with the number of bigger budget blockbusters offering so much better visuals, there's nothing of value here, really. And no, a low budget does not excuse this movie. Ex Machina's budget was only $16 million. Moon's budget from 2009 was only five million dollars. Good filmmakers can work around a low budget, but not the morons responsible for this. So Terry and J-Rod do the common sense thing to do and run back into the main building, and we follow that with Terry later leaving the rest of the group for reasons that are frankly too stupid to explain, and entering a random old man's room who, who we saw earlier in the movie, and we partake in a rip off of a much better scene 2005's War of the Worlds. Totally not the same. So Terry manages to escape, the old man not being so lucky, and he manages to make it back to the room. And for the next several minutes, the cast just hangs out and has CGI lights shine on them. This scene is a shame because it really could have been so much more suspenseful in better hands. 
And I can give a recent example. In the recent movie 10 Cloverfield Lane, we also follow an ordinary person dealing with a world-ending catastrophe right outside her door. The difference is, through building of suspense slowly and developing its characters, it helps you want her to escape, and the danger she gets in leaves you on the edge. It also was made on a budget little different than Skyline. I noted in my review of Alien vs. Predator Requiem that the Strausses seem to replace the proper building of suspense with a series of gross-out gags meant to shock the audience. Skyline is more of the same, as we will get more gross-out gags like that to come. It also doesn't help that nobody here is remotely likable or interesting. Now, a character does not need to be likable in order to be interesting. Hell, all of the characters in Breaking Bad, not a single one of them is particularly likable, but all of them are very interesting, and that's what makes the show so compelling. These characters are neither likable or interesting. They are basically just alien kill fodder. That's all happening right outside, right now. They are everywhere. No, they're not everywhere. They're not over the water. That's right. Yeah, well, it didn't take them very long to find you on the roof. We can drive there in two minutes. You have no idea what they're capable of. So, because you didn't see any of their ships flying over the water, you're going to assume that these spaceships can't fly over the water. Well, what brilliant reasoning. So they decide to make their way downstairs, which at first is a perfectly logical thing to do, but then decide instead of staying in an isolated underground area, they take their cars and make a run for it to who knows where. It's like an Impala running up to a cheetah with a sign that says, EAT ME! So, as anyone who could rub two brain cells together would have predicted, Terry gets immediately smashed by an alien monster, cause who knew going out into the open wasn't a good idea? Wow, you killed the black guy first in a horror movie. At least this movie's doing something different. So a tentacle monster out of a Japanese porno comes after them, which is quickly smashed by the hotel manager played by David E. Yates from Dexter. But before leaving, we see the aliens apparently are here to steal people's brains. <laughs> Don't do that, aliens. You'll never survive with the brains of any of these people. It's a shame. Your race had so much potential. The characters, for inexplicable reasons, decide to go outside where they knew that giant monster was. And then this happens. Oh no, not... Whoever she was. So in order to escape the monster that again they knew was out there, they decide to make their way back into the main building and be at the exact same place they started from. I don't know how this plan failed, it just seems so well reasoned. So the characters take turns keep watch as the aliens continue to ravage the city with cheap special effects and we get a montage of the characters being bored. I know how you feel. That is until Jared sees how badly he was infected by looking into the light earlier. It's never really explained exactly what the light does. Does it slowly turn you into one of them? Does it make you on their side? Does it tr help you track them? I don't know. It never makes it clear. In a cheap version of the fight from Independence Day, we see a group of both manned and unmanned military planes take on the aliens, which ends in a nuclear bomb hitting them. And once again, the Strauss brothers don't have a clue how nuclear shockwaves work because the characters actually survive this despite being close enough to see the entire thing. Uh, how did we, Kronk? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Oh my friggin' god! A nuclear explosion right over the hill, and it didn't even shatter the glass! What madness have I wrought? 
This succeeds in bringing down the mothership, but it sends out wave after wave of fighters as a response and begins slowly healing itself in the mold of the Iron Giant. All right, you stay, I go. No following. We see military copters land on the rooftop, which you would think is a good thing, but apparently the manager thinks it's not for some reason. Get off me! What the hell do you think we you're doing? We let them know that we're here. We'll let everything know. You would say to me for help. Well, help is here. Does that look like a rescue chopper to you? Well, don't you get it? We're at war. Are you kidding me, Strauss brothers? Even in a movie where aliens are dissecting people's brains and the military are fighting them, you still have to throw in your anti-military propaganda? How do you sleep at night? What good is a helicopter? You have to take a chance. A chance? They just nuked the city. And you want to wave hello? And yet you or who are in the city are doing just fine right now. So what's the big deal? It's just nuclear weapons. You're just going to stand there? What happens when the rest of the blinds fall? I mean, we don't exactly have enough bed sheets. <laughs> no, 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 no. You did not just say that. Yeah, yeah. Bed sheets are going to keep you safe from an alien invasion. Yep. I also bet they can't get through pantry doors either. Who knows what side you're on? I'm warning you. Stop it! Look at his face. He's sick. So Jared starts to go all Zool on everybody in response to the manager's insanity, and he and Elaine run out to, uh, to the rescue choppers, which is the thing anyone with half a brain would do if they saw rescue choppers, but the aliens quickly make work of them. They attack our heroes, and Elaine is able to kill one of them with an axe. Yeah, nuclear weapons are totally survivable, but sharp metal objects? That's a threat. So we see the manager sacrifice himself as the aliens bust into his room, and we cut back to Jared who finds the strength to rip open with his hands one of the aliens because the alien beam gave him superpowers or something. Okay, why would aliens give people superpowers if they just plan to dissect them later? Are they going out of their way to not make sense? Eventually, both Elaine and Jared are taken onto the ship using the aliens' beaming technology. Yep, they've had beaming technology this entire time, and yet have used far less efficient methods such as giant monsters and tentacle creatures in order to gather people instead for some reason. We see the aliens harvesting people's brains for... I, I don't know, some completely inexplicable reason. But in this movie's extremely weird moment of what the fuck, Jared's brain is harvested, takes control of an alien body, and before they are to harvest Elaine, the alien Jared tries to fight for Elaine's defense. We get to see this shot of all the aliens against Jared, and... Then the movie just stops here. It doesn't end, it just suddenly stops right here. In the, it stops in the middle of a scene with no resolution to what was built up whatsoever. Well, fuck you too then. This movie makes no sense. Skyline is a terrible movie. Its characters are dull as can be without a shred of likability or character qualities. Its alien invasion plot is nonsensical as we never find out what these aliens want or why they're even attacking. It doesn't build proper suspense ever. Its action sequences are cheap and it just has nothing worth watching. It's a worthless non-movie. What movie? I've already forgotten it exists. The good news is that six years since this movie came out, the sequel shows no signs of going into production and looks forever destined to remain in development hell until everyone forgot this nonsense exists. Seriously, if you were given $10 million, I bet almost any one of my viewers could make a better movie than Skyline. I know you could because you guys are awesome. I'm some loudmouth on the internet and you just heard my opinion. I'm blue.
If you like this video, please consider making a donation to my Patreon.